This is StocksPoker.com, Multi-Table Tournament Pro, Matt Matros. And this is the fifth video I've done for the Stocks Poker University series. This one is called Multi-Table Tournaments 301, Restealing for Profit. And this is the first video I've done at the 300 level, or the professional level, if you will. It definitely goes beyond the kind of thinking where you say to yourself, I have this kind of hand, therefore I should do this. It's actually going to ask you to analyze the entirety of situations to think about many, many factors, only one of which is the two cards that you have in your hand. And it's hopefully going to teach you how to exploit common situations in tournaments to really increase your stack size. If you haven't seen me do a 100 level or 200 level university video, if you haven't checked those out yet, or if you're not a very experienced tournament player already, you might want to stop by some of my earlier videos about how to value your chips possibly or about the tournament player's mindset because those are really sort of prerequisites for this video. If you're not clear on what your goals and what your mindset should be, some of these restealing plays are not going to make any sense to you at all. But if you're if you're with me up to the point this point in the university series, then you're perfectly ready for this, which should be a pretty interesting video. It's going to have a bunch of math. It's going to cover a bunch of concepts, and we're going to feature a few examples as well. So I hope you all enjoy this video. And without further ado, here it is, Restealing for Profit. I'm going to start this video by just explaining what I mean by the term resteal. It, it might mean different things to different people, but it's taken on a pretty common meaning in the poker universe at this point, so I'm going to define that for you. I'm going to go over some of the mathematics behind how and why resteals work. It might just seem like this crazy play that you try once in a while, the resteal, but there's actually a very sound mathematical basis for it, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit. And then I'm going to talk about the criteria you should be considering when you're evaluating a potential resteal opportunity. What kinds of things should you be asking yourself or thinking about when you're at the table and you're considering a resteal? Now, there's actually a list or at least a process that you should go through to determine, okay, is this a good time for me to resteal or is it not? And then we're going to look at a few examples from my play of resteal situations and analyze whether they were good or bad and why, most importantly, why they might have been a good chance for a resteal or a bad chance for a resteal. And of course, those analyses are going to be independent of the results that followed. Okay, what do I mean when I say it's time to try a resteal? Well, what I mean is that I have a relatively weak hand, or at least not a premium hand, not aces or kings, the kind of hand where your best result is that your opponent folds his hand, which is, if he's open raised and you don't have a very deep stack, it's going to constitute most of the hands in your range. And it is a re-raise, the re-steal is a re-raise against a player who is open, who you suspect does not have a very strong opening range. And this often comes against a late position raiser because if someone opens in the button or the cutoff, especially if there are big blinds and antis, they almost always have a wide opening range. So that is always a candidate for, that opener is always a candidate for a re-steal opportunity. So that's where most re-steals come from is when you're re-raising a late position raiser. But it could be against a maniac in early position. It could be you have some read on a guy that for whatever reason this particular hand he's weak. A re-steal covers all of those situations. A re-steal is usually when you're moving all in as the re-stealer or your re-raise would set the initial raiser all in. It doesn't have to be that way, especially early in the tournament. If someone is raising in late position, you could certainly re-raise and neither one of you are going to be committing all of your chips. But I'm going to be spending most of this video talking about the all-in re-steal. Because when you're not all in, you lose some of that showdown equity. You can re-raise and get called and now you might still end up folding later so you're not going to get to the showdown quite as often. So you don't have as much showdown equity as you would if the person called you and then both cards get turned up and now the only way you can lose is if, you, if he, your opponent shows you a better hand. That's not the case when stacks are deep and you re-raise and your opponent might call you whether he's in or out of position. That's a whole different ball game. So those are still re-steals, but they're not really the re-steals I'm going to be spending a lot of time on in this video. Now I personally believe that the re-steal play is so hugely effective in tournaments and is one of the big secrets to tournament success. I know I've used it a ton in the past couple years with very good results. And 
it's become much more widely understood, unfortunately, in the past year in the multi-table tournament world, but it's still a highly effective weapon when used correctly and in the right spot. So it's really something that every good tournament player should put in his arsenal, because if you don't, you're really going to find yourself having trouble picking up chips in the middle stages, because everyone else, at least a lot of the other good players, are already wise to these re-steal concepts. Now that we know what a re-steal is, we could talk about why it actually works, why it's actually profitable. Well, in the broadest sense, a re-steal is profitable because you have two ways to win. Either your opponent can fold immediately and you can pick up the pot, or if he calls you, it's pre-flop. Even if he calls you with aces, you still have a chance to win. And a lot of times he calls you with a hand much worse than aces, so you actually have quite a good chance to win. And that chance is called your showdown equity. The chance that he folds is called your fold equity. At least that's been the common parlance in the poker world. So that sounds well and good, but that can be justification for just about any aggressive play in poker. But it turns out that in this particular situation, or in some specific situations, the re-steal, the pre-flop re-raise all in against a light opener, is very, very highly effective and actually can lead to a very solidly plus EV play. So to illustrate why that is, I'm going to take a look at an example here, an example situation, and we can go through step by step and take a look at the numbers and see how a re-steal is so profitable. All right, so we're at a nine-handed table. Let's say we're in the middle stages of a tournament. Blinds are 500 to 1,000 with 100 ante, which is pretty typical these days in most online and brick-and-mortar tournaments, actually. And it folds to the button who opens for a 3,000. Fairly standard opening raise. The small blind folds, and now the big blind moves in for a total of 20,000. So it costs the button 17,000 more to call. And if the button is thinking about it, there's the 20,000 from the big blind out there, his 3,000, that's 23,000. 500 from the small blind, so that's 23,500, and another 900 in ante, so that's 24,400, and it costs him 17,000 to call. So he's getting, he's got to call 17 to win 24-4. He's not quite getting 3 to 2. He has to win the showdown something like 41% of the time or so to justify a call. So that's what the button should be thinking about here. But Bearing all this in mind, and bearing in mind that typical button players may or may not think this way, what range of hands do you think a typical button, first of all, has opened with to begin with, and then what hands would the button then call the 17,000 more in this situation, assuming that the button has a pretty similar stack size to the big blind. It's gonna, he's either going to set himself all in, or he's going to only have a tiny, tiny bit left if he calls and loses. So think about that for a little minute, bit on your own. Pause the video if you have to. And when you've come up with your answers to those two questions, we're going to continue with this example over in the next slide. I've used this question many times before, and I pretty typically get answers that look something like this. The button opens with pretty much any ace, any pair, or any two Broadway cards, which totals 27.6% of all hands. Now, if I'm the button, I'm going to be opening with a lot more hands, and if a tight player, a very tight player is in the button, he's going to be opening with a lot fewer hands. He's not going to be opening with, say, jack-10, ace, deuce, pair, deuce, deuces. Very tight players will just be folding those hands in the middle stages of a tournament, even on the button. So there is a little bit of wiggle room in there, but this is kind of the normal player you find online in a low to mid-stakes tournament. We can, of course, tweak these numbers later, and we're going to tweak these numbers later. But for now, let's just assume this kind of a button. And this, this hopefully was pretty close to what you came up with when you're thinking of the typical button player, not necessarily the good button player. All right, moving on, that same button would probably call the 17,000 more with, let's say, a pair of sixes or better, ace-10 or better, or king-queen suited. He's going to fold all of those Broadway hands that he opened with except for king-queen and ace-10 and better, and he's going to fold pairs lower than sixes. So... Because he's calling with about 9.2% of his hands, he's actually going to be folding about two-thirds of the time, two-thirds of his range, to the big blinds all in. All right, these are, I think, pretty reasonable assumptions for typical players. You can quibble with it a little, and we're, we're going to mess around with it a little bit later, but this is 
why I think the resteal works, because typical players play something close to this style that I've outlined here. All right, looking at the numbers, when the big blind moves in and the button folds, the big blind has picked up 5,400. The 3,000 from the button's opening raise, 500 from the small blind, the 1,000 that he posted in the big blind, and the 900 in antes, adds up to 5,400. When the big blind gets called, he still might win. And when that does happen, he gets called and he wins. Then he wins the 20,000 that the button had to put in, 500 from the small blind, his 1,000 that he posted in the big blind, and the 900 in antes. That totals 22,000. 400. When the big blind gets called and loses, he loses the 19,000 he had to throw in to make this all in re raise. Oh well. So now we can actually calculate the EV of this play. It is 5,400 that he picks up two thirds of the time. So that's that first term, 5,400 times two thirds, because two thirds of the time the button is folding. And we know that when the big blind moves in and the button folds, the big blind wins 5,400. So 5,400 times 2 thirds, then the other third of the time the button calls, we have this term over here. So it's 1 third times the 22,400 that we win when we win the showdown, minus 19,000 times the amount of time we lose the showdown. So that S is the percentage of the time that we win the showdown. That's our showdown equity. Now that we have that EV equation, we can set the equal to 0, set EV equal to 0, to see what the value of S is to determine how much showdown equity we need for this re-steal to be a profitable play. So if you feel like messing around with that, you can pause the video here, solve that equation on your own, and tell me what you come up with. And uh, once you're ready, you can move on to the next slide. If you solve that equation for S and determine the showdown equity you need, in order for a re-steal to be profitable from the big blind there, it turns out that S is 19.8%. You need to win the showdown against the range the button calls you with 19.8% of the time to break even. Well, if you move in with 7-deuce offsuit and you get called, 7-deuce offsuit actually has enough equity against the button range there to show a front in this hypothetical example. 7-deuce offsuit would have about 24% equity, and we said you only need 20 Turns out any two cards have enough equity against this range that we've given the button. Now again, that range that we gave the button for his opening standards and his calling standards is not going to apply to every player. But I promise you it does apply to a lot of tournament players, and I really do think it applies to the typical low to mid stakes tournament player. So against typical low to mid stakes tournament player, you could literally move all in in the big blind here with any two cards, and it's going to be a profitable play for you in the long run. Now, there are a bunch of caveats that go with this, and we're going to get to that a little bit later. But for right now, I just want you to think about the power of this re-steal play. The strategy that most people have adopted for tournaments, or at the very least that a lot of people have adopted for tournaments, is vulnerable to this play where it doesn't even matter what cards you have in this situation. When you have these stack sizes, you have this profitable play just sitting in your lap, and it doesn't even matter if you have a total garbage hand. I think that's pretty powerful, and that's one of the main reasons I like the resteal so much. Here's a little spreadsheet I came up with to analyze the resteal situation from the example. So it's pretty straightforward. Fold equity, this means the percentage of the time that the re-raiser is going to fold, and in our example he was folding two-thirds of the time. Showdown equity, this is how often we win the showdown if we get called. So I'm saying we had seven deuce offsuit and he was calling with that range that we gave him in the example so we have 24 percent showdown equity. The race size was the initial race size in terms of blinds so he had opened for 3,000 when the blinds were 500 to 1,000 so obviously that's three blinds. The total re-raise here this is what the big blind moved in for total in terms of blinds. In the example, he moved in for 20,000 total when the blinds were 500,000, so that's that number. And this is the total value of the antes plus the small blind in terms of blinds. So there was a $100 ante, nine-handed. That's 900 plus a $500 small blind. That's 1.4 total blinds, or 1,400. So this here formula calculates the EV of the play in terms of blinds. And it's the same exact formula that 
I showed you in the example. This term here, B3 plus B1 plus B5, that's just the total amount that we win when the initial rays are full. So it's his rays plus our big line, that's the 1, plus the antis in the small blinds here, that's B5, times the chance that he folds. That's our fold equity in B1. That's this term. This other term is when he calls, that's 1 minus B1. If we get called, then when we win the showdown, that's B2. We win our opponent's raise, B4, plus our big blind, 1, plus the, the antis in the small blind, B5. And when we lose, that's 1 minus the showdown equity. We lose our, and that's loses by the minus sign here, we lose our initial amount that we put into the pot, which is the total raise size minus 1 for our big blind. Same formula that I showed you in the earlier slide. So it turns out the EV of this play against this button that we've concocted is 0.63. So it's actually a little bit more than a small blind in value from this play, moving in with 7 deuce. See, all right, well, how often would this button have to call us in order for this to not be a profitable play? Let's say instead of calling folding two-thirds of the time, he folds half the time and calls the other half of the time. Okay, now this is a horribly negative EV play for us with 7 deuce offsuit. We actually cost ourselves almost two big blinds by making the play. So that's that's quite a big difference there. What if he folds, say, 60% of the time? Now it's still negative, but less so, a little less than a big blind. The break-even point's probably somewhere around 0.63 or 0.64. Yeah, so we're, we're still profitable at 0.64. And you could play around with this on your own if you create the, the spreadsheet, and you can use Solver if you want to get the exact solutions to questions like the one I'm posing here. But let's look at a more realistic situation because here we have seven deuce, which has a very low showdown equity. And actually our showdown equity is going to improve if he is calling with more hands. So you have to plug that in as well if you're thinking of doing the entire problem. So more realistically, you're usually going to have at least 30% showdown equity against any kind of range with the hand that you move in with if he's going to be calling more often. So all of a sudden it becomes a lot more profitable again. Now let's say he folds half the time, unprofitable. So you can see how I'm playing around with the numbers here and how it depends so much on exactly how loose or tight your opponent is and not really so much in your show than equity. I mean you can changing show than equity clearly changed things for us. It made the break even point some somewhere between he's him folding 62% of the time and him folding 55% of the time. But Really, the fold equity is, is the big key. If he folds a lot, if he folds two-thirds of the time or more, it doesn't even matter what we have. And if he folds hardly ever, for example, if he only folds 30% of the time, which means he calls with 70% of his hands, you can see that we actually need a lot more showdown equity. In fact, we need about 40% showdown equity is the roughly break-even point. That it's not quite exact, but it's pretty close. So if we have an opponent on the button who's calling with 70% of the hands he opened with, you'd actually need real showdown equity about to win the hand. Let's now say we're dealing with a button who's defending his raise quite liberally. In fact, he's calling the all-in re-raise from the big blind with 70% of the hands he opened with. He's only folding with 30% of them. Well, now the big blind needs to win the showdown about 40% of the time, so he certainly can't make that re-raise all in with any two cards anymore. But what can't hands could he do it with profitably? Well, let's take a look at Poker Stove over here. Now, if you remember, we had the button raising with 27.6% of his hand, so if he's going to be calling with the top 70% of that, he'll be calling with about nine, the top 19.5% of his hand. So taking a look here in Poker Stove, and you can see... If we have him calling with any suited ace, ace six off suited up, king jack off suited up, king ten suited, and any pair, that adds up to 19.5% of hands. So that's a pretty good approximation, I think, of the top 19.5% of hands. So we'll say this is the range that the button calls with if the big if big blind moves in. So now what hands will have 40% equity against that range from the big blind standpoint, the equity that we need to break even? Well, does ace eight off suit have that much? equity against that range? Yes, it does. 
What about a 7 offsuit? Just underneath, and since 40% was a little low, we can see that a 7 offsuit is not a good enough hand. How about king-queen offsuit? Sure, no problem, 41.7. King-jack offsuit? Doesn't quite make it. So, so far it's king-queen and better, and ace-8 and better. How about any pair? Two deuces? Two deuces, sure, that means any pair has enough equity. And how about any suited ace? How about ace four suited? Let's try that one. Just barely makes the cut, which probably means ace three suited is not going to be good enough. And sure enough, just quite underneath the 40% that's necessary. How about suited kings? How about, let's try king ten suited. See if that's good enough. Yes, just barely is. King nine suited? Not quite. And there's a few other suited connectors that it turns out will be good enough. Let's try the 10-9 suited suited connector. Yeah, that's good enough. How about 9-8 suited? I'm not sure what happened there, but 9-8 suited, not quite. So the range that we then have the big blind properly moving in with is ace-8 off suitor better, any pair, these suited connectors over here, and suited aces down to ace four, and king queen offsuit, and king ten suited, and up. Only 17% of hands are now profitable for the big blind to move in with if the button is taking on this strategy. So we've gone from it was profitable for the big blind to move in with any two cards to the big blind can only move in with 17% of his hands if the button is taking on sorry the button is taking on this strategy here where he's folding only 30% of the time so the moral of the story here was that it was much easier to play against the button when he only called the all in when he had a fairly decent hand when he decided to defend his raise much more liberally and call the all in with weaker hands like a6 offsuit and things like that Suddenly, the big blind can only play the top 17% of his hands profitably for this re-steal. Now, the button could probably do even better by opening more hands to begin with. If he did that, he probably wouldn't have to call with the top 70% of his hands. But I think it's probably a pretty good idea, if you're the button in this situation, if you want to avoid being exploited, to be calling, let's say, the top 60% of your hands or so. If you do that, and you're folding... 40% of the time, then the big blind's going to need some at least halfway decent showdown equity to show a profit against you. You can see 35% is not enough. Around 37%, a little more, he's going to need to show profit. So that's certainly not any two cards kind of range. It's certainly, he has to be a little discriminatory. And in practice, most players still aren't restealing quite this often, so you could probably get away with folding 50% of the time if you were the button. But I think the point of the exercise here is clear, which is that there can be a lot of opportunities for a re-steal against most typical players, no matter what cards you have. The main issue is what kind of person is, is opening on the button. How often is he going to call if you move in? And if you have enough data on him to know that, then that certainly helps. But a lot of times in tournaments, we just don't see enough of these situations against specific players to really have, a, have data to be able to tell, okay, this guy's going to fold a lot, this guy's going to call a lot so really the best judge of the best way to judge it is to observe how he's playing and really pay attention over as much time as you can to get a sense of the kind of opponent you're up against and if you're up against a folder by all means you should be trying the re-steal and if you're up against the caller you might have to be a little more selective in your re-steal choices Let's look at a few example reseal situations. So in this first one, I'm in the small blind. As you can see, blinds are 150 300 with a $15 ante. I've got a monster hand, jack-4 offsuit. It folds around to watch the C in the hijack, and he makes kind of a small raise, 740, which with antes out there, especially from the hijack, is a pretty small opening amount. So let's, let's stop for a second and look at the criteria right now. What are the stack sizes, first of all? Well, 
Watch to see started the hand with only about 17 or 18 blinds or so. So he's got pretty much the ideal stack size for me to re-steal. I'd like it even more if he had about 20 blinds in his stack, but he definitely has an amount where he clearly has plenty of chips left if he folds, so he's going to be inclined to fold. He's not going to feel pot committed, and at the same time, he's, he's not going to feel like he has to make a move because he's so short either, but he's not going to feel like he has so many chips that he should just call me because I'm short. Basically, we have some similar stack sizes I actually haven't covered, so the stack sizes are good for me to try a re-steal play. Initial race size. Again, this is good for me. He has given himself room to get away from the hand. I don't think he's opening with a monster hand here for this amount, at least not most of the time. Most players who make that kind of cute re-raise, a cute opening raise like that usually don't have huge hands, so his initial raise size is good for me to try a re-steal. Positions. Well, he's in the hijack. That means he probably has somewhat of a wide range. Obviously, I'd rather he be in the button or the small blind because then he would have an even wider range and I'd probably have a better shot at getting him to lay down and maybe even slightly more showdown equity if he called. But on the other hand, because he's not on the cutoff or the button, he might not put me on a re-steal as easily. So, I don't love the position, but I don't hate it either. It's still a very good position for me in which to try the re-steal play. His tendencies, well, I don't really remember this hand, so I can't speak to it, but because I did end up trying this re-steal, as I know from looking at this hand history, I must have n had some idea that he would be more likely than not to fold, because I probably would not have tried this re-steal here without yet another compelling reason. And again, I don't know what my image was either, but I imagine I haven't been all that active considering I don't have a ton of chips myself, and I tried this play. I, I must not have had the image of someone who is kind of lunatic. My hand, well, my hand is not very good, but as you know, you don't have to have a great hand to try a re-steal, as all the math has shown. And what stage of the tournament are we in? Well, you know these Poker Stars tournaments typically start with about 1,500 in blinds or so, so we're solidly into the middle stages here. This seems like a pretty good chance with the blinds of 150, 300, and a 15 ante to try a re-steal play. So I have a lot of things going for me here in this hand, and that's why I do end up trying the re-steal. It turns out he folds. Now, does that mean this was a good play on my part? Not necessarily. Maybe watch to see he was just opening with seven deuce this time, and he decided to fold it. That was not why... I tried the re-steal, really. I tried it because I thought he would fold a big percentage of the hands he opened with, but not that he was opening with some terrible hand in this particular hand. So it's important not to be influenced by the results. I made the decision for those reasons. The result was good, but the result doesn't prove that my decision was correct. In the second example, you can see I'm in the small blind again. Blinds 500 to 1,000 with 100 ante. And it folds around to the player in the button. And he opens for 3,000, just in our example. Unlike in our example, I have about 17 blinds and change instead of the 20 blinds. So I have not quite as many blinds as I would like, but let's look further at the situation. The player who opened on the button is the chip leader at the table. But he only has 41 blinds. It's not like he has a monster stack. There's a big difference between a chip leader who has 40 blinds and a chip leader who has 100 blinds, 120 blinds. He's opening on the button, and he has two of the shortest stacks at the table in the blinds. And in particular, he has the shortest stack at the table in the big blind. So in my opinion, he's going to be opening extremely liberally here. So this is a piece of information that I think... I can use to my advantage. I basically think he's opening with almost any two cards, which means he's certainly not going to be able to call me with as many hands as he should in order for this not to be a profitable play. Basically, I think he's opening so wide here that it's plus EV for me to re-raise all in with any two cards. Obviously, position is also favorable for me. I have an opponent opening on the button, but really you can, you can sort of take all that into account by looking at the big picture here and seeing why I think this is a profitable place to re-steal. I have a good stack size for it. My opponent has an enormously wide range, and I just expect him to be opening every hand here, so I go ahead and move in all my chips. And he does fold. Again, his fold does not prove this was a good play, but I think I had a pretty sound reason for this decision, and so I made it. In this last example, again, blinds are 500 to 1,000 with a $100 ante. And it folds around to the player in the cutoff. 
and he makes it 2,600 out of his 16,000. So he's got about 16 blinds. Again, it's a little smaller than I would like, but I like that I have him covered, and I like that he opened for an amount that leaves him room to fold if he wants to. Again, I don't necessarily put someone on a monster hand when they make this open raise, as you know from the earlier examples. So it folds over to me, and I have about 18 blinds. Again, it matters more the smaller number of the two players, in this case my opponent who has 16, but it's also sort of good that I don't have a ton of chips, because if I had maybe 200,000, he might just think I'm trying to bully him. So it's, it's somewhat of a, of a factor in my favor that I have a similar stack size to my opponent here. So what else can we consider? Well, the positions, clearly he's in the cutoff. He's going to have a pretty wide range to be opening from there. His tendencies, again, I'm not sure, but I do like that he opened for an amount that's definitely smaller than even I would make it when they're antis. If someone's making a smaller race size than even I would open for, you know it's pretty small, because those of you who watch my videos understand that I like to open for small raises. I, I like to try to keep the pot relatively small, but this is getting carried away to be opening for 2.6 blinds in the cutoff when there are antis involved. So that's definitely going for me. My hand, well, again, my hand is not a very good one, but as I've been saying over and over again, your hand is not really one of the most important concerns. It's pretty low on the list of what you should be thinking about. And again, we're safely in the middle stages here, late middle, really, with the level 11 blinds 500 to 1,000. This is a pretty good spot to have a ton of fold equity, in my view. So I go ahead and try the all-in re-raise. And I get called by ace-queen, naturally. That's a hand that pretty much no one is going to fold in that situation. If, if they do fold, you should definitely be moving in with any two and not even thinking about it. And I lose. The couple points we made here, though. First of all, part of the value of the play comes in the fact that I have 5-3 against ace-queen. I'm not that far behind. I still have a pretty reasonable chance of winning the hand. And the second point is, was this a bad play? Well, Again, we, just like we couldn't say they were good plays when the results were in our favor, you can't say this was a bad play because the result didn't go our way. We ran into a huge hand. That's always possible. Someone can always happen to have a big hand. But if, if this guy was opening with the kind of hands that I thought he was opening with and only calling with, say, ace-jack or better and pairs of sevens are better or even ace-queen are better, then this was a wonderful play, and it just turns out we ran into ace-queen. So, again, don't draw too many conclusions from the results. The reasons behind this play were very similar to the reasons behind all the plays that worked. And you've seen all the math, you've seen all the logic at this point. It's a sound play. Don't get discouraged if every once in a while something like this happens. The number one thing that a typical tournament player can do to improve his game is to learn how to re-steal. So I hope this video has helped you to do that. You've got to go in with the attitude that you're not worried about busting, you're not trying to protect your chips, you're using the mindset that I've kind of instilled in you from my other videos. You're trying to get as many chips as possible any way you can, and you're not going to be embarrassed if you get caught with nine deuce offsuit. It doesn't really matter what cards you have. It's not about that. It's about making a good, sound, logical play. And if you can do that, and if you're not afraid to do it, and if you're not worried about getting caught, you can really be a force to be reckoned with at tournament tables. Remember, making a sound, logical play backed by mathematics is more important than, oh, I only have seven deuce, therefore I'm supposed to fold. Logic can trump that seven deuce every time. I hope you enjoyed this video. This has been Matt.